Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted, you should listen to all of the episodes as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Kelly Neenstadt, who's the Assistant Director of Admissions at Marist College. Kelly, thank you so much for being with us today. How are you? Thanks for having me. I'm good. How are you? I'm great, and it's our pleasure to have you, so let's get right into it. Kelly, tell us about yourself. How long have you been in admissions, and how did you end up in such a position? Yeah, so I graduated from Marist in May of 2019, and as a student, I worked in the admission office as an ambassador, a tour guide, and a student assistant. And when I graduated, there was a position open, so I applied, and I started full-time working in the admission office in August of 2019. So I've been here ever since. Fantastic, and we're really looking forward to this conversation, as I know that many of my students, current and former, applied attended, and had nothing but great things each and every time to say about Marist College. So Kelly, what is it about Marist College that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately want to attend? Yeah, I think it sounds very cliche, but I think the people is number one. We just have great students, great faculty members, staff members, and I think it's a very welcoming and open community for students like across the board. And I think we just have a lot to offer for our students, whether it's multiple options for majors and minors, clubs, activities, study abroad. There's just so much to do and so much for everyone that I think everyone kind of finds their spot. Fantastic. And I myself have been on campus many times with my own family. Marist College is located in Poughkeepsie, and it overlooks the Hudson River, one of the most beautiful campuses I've ever seen. So Kelly, let me ask, because many students and their parents have reached out suggesting I ask questions about life on campus. What can you tell us about life on campus outside of the classroom? Yeah, there's a lot to do. I think when I was looking at colleges myself, I wanted a college that had lots of clubs, activities, and that's what you'll get at Marist. We have over 80 clubs and organizations on campus. We have 23 Division I athletic teams. We have 17 club sports, intramurals. And so many students get involved across the board in at least two or three clubs, if not more. One of our biggest clubs is student, our Student Programming Council, and they host a lot of events, not only on campus, but also off campus as well. So so they have a bingo once a month on campus where students can win prizes and play bingo. We have outdoor movie nights. We have yoga nights. We have $25 Broadway trip tickets. We have ski and snowboarding trips. We have Yankee game trips. We have trips to the Woodbury Commons for shopping. So there's just so much that allow our students to really experience life outside of the classroom on campus and across campus as well as outside of that too. Well, that's terrific. And thank you so much for sharing Kelly, how many applications do you review a year and do you represent a specific region? 
Yeah, so I do represent a specific region. I have Long Island as my full territory. I do have a few other states, including Wyoming, but Long Island's my main territory that I travel to and work very closely with those students. We receive a little over 11,000 applications a year. And wow. we review from a middle of November to about February, March, we're reviewing about 40 applications a day. So each one of us in the admission office. So it's a pretty, pretty high number of students that we review. Yeah, that's definitely a lot of applications. <laughs> so Kelly, can you walk us through the process of how you evaluate so many applications? Are there teams of people representing different regions? If so, how many applications is each group reviewing? People always ask about these types of questions. And so any insight that you could offer would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. So our first round of review for applications, we each, each of the admission counselors in the office get about 40 per day. Most of the time when we first start out in November, they are separated by region. So I'm reading mainly Long Island students from about November to end of December, and we read about 40 a day, and that's our first initial review. Then we go into a second review sometime in the middle of December, where we come together as a committee to go through with some applications and some students just to make a decision on them. And some students apply to specific programs. So like the learning support program, our higher education opportunity program, some of those programs require a third review as well, just because they're much larger, much bigger applications and have a separate piece as well. Fantastic. And so speaking of the freshman class, what is the average profile of the current freshman class? Yeah, so most of our students have between an 87 and a 93 average, which is a 3.1 to 3.7. Most of our students were from across the country. So we had students apply from I think about 48 states in the nation and then about 55 countries. And it's very similar to last year, but the students this year were a little bit more competitive. So we saw an increase just in numbers, whether that's GPA um, as well as SAT and a higher number of honors, AP and college courses taken too. Fantastic. And Kelly, if a prospective student falls a little below the current freshman class's average, what are some of the things that they can do to enhance their overall application? Yeah, so we do definitely track demonstrated interests. So we want to see a student that's visiting campus, that's come to a college fair, that's come to a high school visit, that's connected with their direct admission counselor or kind of outside of that. That's something that we do review within the application process, along with the students' grades, transcripts, the classes they've taken, their clubs, activities, things like that. So demonstrated interest is something that we like to see because we want a student that's interested in Maris too. Great advice. Thank you so much. And I know, Kelly, that Marist is in fact test optional, but how does leaving out the test scores in schools that are test optional influence financial aid awards on the merit-based side? I understand that need-based financial aid is, of course, based on the FAFSA and CSS profile wherever applicable, but I'm wondering if there is a disadvantage in terms of getting merit-based scholarships if a school is in fact test optional. Yeah, great question. With our merit-based scholarships, we definitely do focus on the academic piece, like the student's grades and their transcript, things like that. But we also do look at a student outside of their transcript as well for the merit-based. So if a student does not submit their SAT scores, we'll review them the exact same way as a student that does. So I usually tell students, we look at students on an individual basis. So we have student A and student B. Student A, let's say, submits their test score. Student B does not. We'll review students A, student A's application with the grades, their transcript, the types of classes they've taken, and their SAT scores. Then we'll look at student B and review their grades, their transcripts, the types of classes they've taken, and we'll just review everything else since they didn't submit their scores. Understood, and I appreciate that explanation. And a lot of people are very skeptical, Kelly, when they hear that a college is, in fact, test optional. So again, I know that Marist College is test optional. Would you be able to share with us the percentage of admitted students? So that means the current freshman class, the percentage that were admitted without having submitted mm -hmm. test scores. Yeah, so students that were admitted across the board, about 50% of them submitted their scores and about 50% of them didn't. So it's very much half and half. Well, I really appreciate that insight. Again, as I said, a lot of people are very skeptical when they hear test optionals. So it's very interesting to hear that 50% of the admitted students 
did not submit their test scores. And like you said, it's a it's an even split. Really appreciate that. Kelly, do you use the student's high school GPA as indicated on their transcript, or do you recalculate it using your own metrics? If so, whatever insight you could share with us would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, we use the student's grades from their transcript. So we take the GPA directly from their transcript, and that's what we use within our system. Great. Thank you. And of course, the student's activity sheet is another piece of their application. What are the kinds of things you are looking for beyond the work they did in the classroom? Yeah, definitely involvement. As I mentioned earlier, we have an active campus, so we want students who are going to come to campus, get involved, join our clubs. I tell students a lot of the times, too, 100 average is great, a bunch of APs, great, but if you're not involved, that's not what we're looking for. So we want a student that does well in class, but also is maybe a part of the environmental club on campus or has done something in their community or works a part-time job or has family responsibilities. One thing about the activity sheet is that students should include everything possible. Uh, I've had a few students say, should I include this family responsibility or I didn't didn't put my part-time job on my activity sheet. You definitely should because that's something that we want to see as long as a student is committed to the things that they do and has great time management skills with balancing a bunch of different things. That looks great on our end. Well, that's great insight, Kelly. We appreciate it. And how important are students' grades in senior year? Can you give an example of why a student's senior year grades made you change your mind regarding their admission status? Yeah, so they're definitely important. I uh, We uh, do uh, take the transcript from senior year at the end of the semester. So when students are graduating and complete their senior year, we'll take that final high school transcript. And we just want to make sure that our students didn't kind of drop the ball during their senior year. <laughs> we want students to remain as focused as they had been throughout their freshman, sophomore, and junior year, and then into senior year. We've had a few students in the past drop classes like in the middle of the year in January. So when students do that, we just ask them to email. We'll double check with the admission committee, but usually it's not a problem. Really appreciate that insight. And of course, my next question is about the college essay, another piece of the application. Kelly, what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? In other words, when you read them, you thought, wow, this kid really has to come to school at Marist College. Yeah, the two essays I would say that stand out most, and they sound a little silly saying them out loud, but one of the (laughs) essays was about a student who was a middle child, and he just explained his family role in his family. And I'm a middle child too, so (laughs) I think it definitely resonated with me. And he just explained his family responsibilities, what he does in the house, and it was very humorous, so it didn't make me laugh, but that was one of my favorite essays that I've read. Another essay that really stands out is a girl wrote about how Taylor Swift, how Taylor Swift's songs has inspired her in different areas and chapters of her life. So that I love Taylor Swift. So that definitely spoke to me. And I think the way that it was written, it just went through the different chapters in her life and how each song had meaning to her. And those two essays really stand out to me because it just talked about the students themselves. That's what we want to hear in the essay, the students themselves, what they've done, what something that's impacted them. I know a lot of students will write about their grandparents and aunts and uncles, and that's it's very nice to read, but we want to know about the students. So I really enjoyed those two. There was another student who wrote about getting Harry Styles tickets, which also was <laughs> an interesting topic, but they just wrote about their experience, and that's it was really nice to just hear about them and kind of see what type of student they are, too. Kelly, do you offer any supports for students that may have had an IEP or a 504 while in high school? And if so, can you explain what you offer? Yes. So we have our full Office of Accommodations and Accessibility, and there's kind of two two different sections within that office. One section is our learning support program. That is a fee-based program. It does require a separate application on top of the actual like Maris application or common application. And students, if they're accepted into that program, they will pay an extra fee each semester, but they will also meet with a learning specialist twice a week for 45 minutes. And that learning specialist really kind of works with them to figure out their goals, their academic plans throughout each week, each month, and each semester. With that program, students do have to have a designated learning disability or ADHD. 
With on the other side of that office, so it's separate from the learning support program, we also offer general accommodations as well. So if a student had a 504 or an IEP in high school, they can bring that and transfer that to Marist. So there are specific documentation that students just have to submit to the Office of Accommodations and Accessibility to get those accommodations, whether it's like extra time on tests or taking tests in a different room, things like that. But we definitely support our students across the board too. Well, thank you so much for that comprehensive explanation. And I'm going to include the Marist College Office of Admissions link in the show notes. Kelly, if there's anything else that you want to include for students and parents, just send them to me and I'll be sure to include them. So thank you so much. Yeah. Kelly, what about students aspiring to play sports in college? What advice do you have for prospective student athletes in terms of making their intentions to play known? Absolutely. I think the first step is getting started as early as possible. So your sophomore, junior year, if you play soccer or if you run track and field and you think that you want to continue that, definitely start reaching out to coaches at like any schools that you're looking into. For Marist, we have a website called goredfoxes.com where it lists, it has the full schedule of all of our sporting games, all of our events, and it also lists the roster of each team. So I always encourage students to go to the roster, reach out to one of the assistant coaches and just say that you're interested and kind of get the ball rolling with that. And then with the actual like application process, we have each of the admission counselors has their own team. So they act as a liaison with the coaches. So they work very closely with the coaches on students that have reached out to them or students that the coaches have already reached out to. So it's a very hand in hand process, but definitely getting started as early as possible and reaching out to the coaches. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks again for sharing that website. I'll put that in the show notes as well. And Kelly, in closing, what are the top three pieces of advice you would give a student and their parents who are getting ready for the college admissions process? Yeah, that's also a great question. And my number one piece of advice is to try not to stress out as much as possible. It's a definitely <laughs> a, it's a comprehensive process and it really spans throughout the entire senior year and starting in the summer of junior year but it will all work out in the end. And I think students will make the best decision for them in the end. So just trying to keep a calm attitude, calm mind throughout the process, I think just really helps. My second piece of advice is to visit whichever schools a student is interested in. A lot of times we'll hear, especially at Marist, that when students stepped onto campus, they knew that Marist was the one for them. Marist was one where they wanted to go. So I definitely encourage students just to visit and see as many schools as possible, as possible because you might love it online and in pictures, and then you might visit and not like it so much. So just seeing it in person really helps. And my third piece of advice is to uh, also just enjoy senior year. If you're a rising senior, I can, like I mentioned, it's it can be a stressful process applying for college and starting that whole journey, but definitely enjoy senior year as much as possible because there are so many fun events and things to go to. Well, Kelly, those are great pieces of advice and great insight. I really want to thank you so much for sharing all your expertise with us today, as I know it's going to help so many students and their parents. We really appreciate everything you've done today. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate working with you and you having me on your show. It's been my pleasure, and I hope to have you again. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.